Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the latest Asian Carp Canada webinar. My name is Rebecca Schroeder, and I work on the Asian Carp Program at the Invasive Species Center in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Today's webinar is titled, Developing a Strategic Response Plan Using Incident Command Structure for Asian Carps in the Great Lakes. I'm pleased to introduce our two speakers for today, John Saunders and Becky Cudmore. John is the President and Chair of the Board of Directors for CANOP. He is also president and owner of Saunders Enterprises and Emergency Management Services. He has 25 plus years of experience working in the emergency management profession. He has been involved in the response to 9-11, SARS, several hur American hurricanes, tornadoes, the 2004 tsunami, and multiple floods. He has worked closely with many First Nation communities, including being the lead for the declared emergency in Attawapiskat in 2012, interacting with all levels of government. His most recent international deployment was to Haiti, the Haiti earthquake, and then a 30-day deployment with a mobile field hospital in response to the cholera outbreak. He has been actively engaged in the continuing development of the emergency management profession, serving as president with the International Association of Emergency Managers for Canada, for the Canadian Council, and the 2013 IAEM Global Business Director. John continues to work on the Global Special Projects Committee and serves on the IAEM Canada Board of Directors. He has been identified as a crisis communications leader, an early adopter of social media and emergency management, and works closely with traditional media, providing subject matter content to advance personal and corporate preparedness messaging and overall promotion of the emergency management profession. He is a known champion regarding inclusive emergency management, both in emergency planning and response. We also have Becky Cudmore, who is the Regional Manager for Fisheries and Oceans Canada's Aquatic Invasive Species Program for the Department's Central and Arctic Region. And this region covers Ontario, the Prairies, and the Arctic. This program includes the Asian Carp Program for the Great Lakes. Becky has a postgraduate degree in zoology from the University of Toronto and a joint undergraduate degree in biology and environmental science from Trent University in Peterborough. Becky has worked on aquatic invasive species in the International Great Lakes for almost 20 years and was the recipient of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Award for her contributions and efforts to protect the Great Lakes from aquatic invasive species. So now that I've introduced our two speakers, um, I just want to point out that after they give their presentations, we'll have time for some questions. So if at any time throughout the presentation you have a question, you can type it in the question box and our presenters will do their best to answer it following the webinar. So with that, I'd like to pass things over to um, Becky and John. All right, well, thanks, everyone. Um, there we go. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks for dialing in and listening to uh, this tag team talk between John and I. Uh, as much as possible for a webinar, we will try to keep it informal, and you may hear one of us jump in to clarify or add further information um, with the other presenter. And we look forward to uh, your your discussion questions at the end of the presentation. So the webinar is going to go through um, uh, the Asian carps and just making sure we're all on the same page in case we have some, some people new to invasive species on the line. And a little bit about the Fisheries and Oceans Canada program. We're going to provide an introduction to the incident command system provide examples of response and our learning from those examples, uh, which has led us to the creation of a strategic response plan using incident command system, provide a bit of information on our steps moving forward, and leave time for questions at the end. So when we say Asian carps, we just want to make sure that everybody understands that we are talking about four different species. We're talking about grass carp, black carp, silver carp, and big head carp. And these species are, are currently found in the United States uh, in established populations. And we're seeing uh, quite a dramatic impact from these aquatic invasive species. We're seeing a loss of the diversity of the uh, native fishes as well as the loss of their habitat. We're seeing damage to nets from commercial fishermen, as well as a decline in the fishery value uh, for the commercial fishery. 
And of course, as the YouTube sensation, these fish do leap out of the water. Uh, they are large body fish, as you can see from the previous slide, and uh, do cause injury and boat damage uh, upon impact. The DFO's Asian Carp Program began in 2012, and it was built on four pillars where we look at activities under prevention, such as outreach and education, conducting research, as well as risk assessments. We, we conduct early warning surveillance activities throughout the Great Lakes. We also talk about, or we also deal with response by providing advice analysis, as well as taking action. And our fourth pillar is management, not control of, a, of an established population, but of the pathways through which these species could enter the Canadian waters of the Great Lakes. So our management actions evolve around, revolve around regulations as well as pathway management. So this talk today is going to focus specifically on the response pillar. And why is response important? Well, well, of course, our goal and the focus of the program is on prevention. We do need to be prepared if prevention fails. So this is an example of what invasion ecologists use as an invas invasive species curve. And associated with this curve is the population levels of the species out of concern, as well as the management actions that should be taken at different points of the invasion. You can see by the bottom bar that the economic return is much better focusing on prevention than dealing with a well-established population down the road. So this is why we do focus on prevention, but we do need to be prepared and have a safety net if that prevention action fails. And shortly after entry of a species, we need to be um, prepared to deal with eradication or some sort of response. So have we caught Asian carp in the Great Lakes? Yes, we have to date. So this is the uh, where Asian carp has been found since the program started in 2012. And as you can see, all the species, uh, all the specimens have been one species of Asian carp, the grass carp. But I do want to point out that despite finding uh, a few individuals of grass carp in the Canadian waters of the Great Lakes, there is no evidence of establishment of these species in Canadian waters. So, uh, in total, we have captured since 2012, when the program began, 25 grass carp in the Canadian waters of the Great Lakes. Um, 15 were captured by DFO through our early warning surveillance program, and eight were by other agencies or people using gears that we do use and, and deploy in our early detection, or, or, yeah, early detection surveillance program. Of these captures, there have been 12 official responses, um, one of which may be a little less official than the others. It's important to us to know upon capture of a live Asian carp, whether um, if it's a black carp or a grass carp, if that species is sterile or fertile. These species are known to uh, be found in the wild uh, due to um, the introduction, the purposeful introduction uh, of especially grass carp into the wild for biological control of aquatic weeds. And these some of these specimens were sterilized before they entered the ecosystem. These species are long-lived, and so upon capture of one of these species, an individual uh, could be a sterile fish or a fertile fish, and of course, the level of concern uh, differs between the two um, possibilities. So here's some examples of some of the species that um, are some of the uh, captured grass carp that we have found to date. I'm happy to say, for the most part, we have sad-looking faces on our employees um, upon capture of these fish. So I'm going to turn it over now to John to walk you through uh, the incident command system. Oops. Thanks very much, Becky. Um, 
So given the history of uh, DFO's responses to, especially with their surveillance program, developing a formalized response plan or a strategic response plan based on the findings that was deemed to be uh, a logical next step. They've had great successes with surveillance, but what happens uh, when things are identified? So once, especially once the fertility testing has been complete, uh, for this particular species, it triggers uh, different response levels based on the findings. Uh, incident Command was originally developed uh, in California uh, regarding wildfire uh, and the fighting, coordinating the fighting of firefighters in, Cal in California. It uh, has been adopted across North America and now into other countries by way of being the standard recognized uh, framework under which to respond to large-scale disasters and emergencies. So how does that tie in with Asian carp? It's, it's certainly not a tornado, but the impact certainly could uh, be, uh, as Becky mentioned, extremely impactful to our environment and native species. Uh, with Incident Command, what it allows us to do is to operate in a common operating area with very, very clear lines of communication and lines of responsibility. It allows us to have common terminology, uh, as I mentioned, a common communication protocol. And one of the, the best values of the ICS model is while we call it a structure, its value is in its flexibility to expand and contract based on the needs of the incident. So it isn't just natural disasters where ICS is used. Um, I personally have used it to coordinate a conference um, here in Ontario, the, the Provincial Emergency Management Conference that ran for about four years here in the province, was all coordinated, structured, and run using ICS. With with ICS, it is any type of incident, so that certainly qualifies when it comes to responding to uh, invasive species. It can be responded to as a planned incident. Uh, ICS and IMS are somewhat interchangeable. Incident command is traditionally those that are, it's a system that is developed for those that are actually on the ground responding to something. Incident management is the overall organizational uh, response uh, structure to an incident. Uh, within I, I, ICS and IMS, there are very unique titles, and this is usually one of the biggest challenges for those who are adopting into an ICS model, is that you may be called an operations chief, but that doesn't make you chief of the boat. Um, it's only for the purposes of the operation that that would become your title. So it has nothing to do with pay grades or rank within an organization. The titles used within, within incident command and incident management structures are strictly for the response itself. Uh, by using the common terminologies, including uh, position titles, it prevents confusion. Um, so one might be a director within a ministry, but for the purposes of um, the ICS structure, they may be a deputy or an assistant uh, chief uh, or second in command. Uh, it's no insult to their being a director at a ministry level. It's just simply that is the function that they play within the structure. And this can change um, depending on span of, span of control, uh, which is usually recommending that no more than five to seven people report into one entity or one position. Uh, so as you expand, you might need to create other titles, uh, which will be demonstrated in other slides. So this is your standard ICS structure organizational chart. This is pretty much your launching pad uh, for ICS, starting with an incident commander or an IC, you might often hear that expression. Part of that uh, command structure is always considering public information, and that could be a communications officer, a public information officer. It really will depend on the needs of your particular incident making room for a liaison officer that will feed into your structure from other supporting uh, stakeholders, such as conservation authorities, may want to have a liaison into your structure, and you may want to have a liaison into theirs. So this way, information can be readily shared 
so that discussions uh, within one stakeholder group can be certainly shared with the other stakeholders. And this quite often will happen within an emergency operations center, whether it's a formal one or sitting around the same table in a boardroom and just having a discussion by way of what the situation is, what's the planning, and that liaison officer would be able to speak on behalf of the various stakeholders. Most importantly is a safety officer. Uh, obviously, the, this is not the person who's in charge of the boat, for example. This is somebody who's looking at the overall safe operation of the particular incident, and that includes the well-being of those that are working uh, within an operation center, emergency operations center, ensuring that they are having breaks, that they're not working uh, 12, 15-hour days uh, with no break. Um, then you get into your command staff, or sorry, your general staff, which is operations, planning, logistics, finance, and admin. Everybody within these dark blue boxes are referred to as chiefs, and then each operations chief would develop the structure, so the operations chief, sorry, would develop the structure that is required in order to successfully do the job. Um, and I'm going to focus strictly on operations at this point, as well as logistics a little bit later by way of how it ties in to how we work closely with DFO in developing this response structure. The one other comment I'll make on this slide is this does not mean one person for every single box. In many cases, one person could be filling the roles of uh, two or three functions. For example, the incident commander could very easily be the operations chief. There might not need to be a second person who's doing that, depending on the scale and the size and complexity of the operation. The safety officer could also be the logistics chief. So just because we have the boxes there to ensure that the function is considered when, when uh, performing uh, or responding to the incident, as opposed to necessarily saying in every incident you must have a minimum of eight people involved in the structure. There we go. So just to, I've covered some of this already, but just by way of what are the roles within each of these, Command is obviously the overall responsibility and sets the objectives, and ICS uses that terminology that it's management by objectives. So what is it do we want to accomplish in what time period, and then figuring out how we're going to do it. Um, the operations, basically, that's the tactical part. That's it. Let's get it done, team. Planning, helping to establish what are the objectives, especially for the next operational time frame. Logistics. That's all resources and all other services needed to provide support to the operations chief. Uh, this, this also usually involves both human uh, resources as well as staff resources. Finance and admin, uh, in many cases, especially within an invasive species, it's an important function, but a lot of it is managed by the day-to-day -day staff. But some considerations for this include what pre-authorizations would an incident commander need to have in place to quickly and effectively respond to an invasive species where it, some of the findings are drastic and a large-scale operation is needed. Having those HR policies in place by way of that, that delegation of authority when it comes to financial matters gives both the logistics chief and the incident commander, usually uh, authorities well beyond what they would normally have in the day-to-day -day jobs. So if you as a manager can authorize purchases of $5,000 per expense, during an operation you might need to have $25,000 per, uh, per expense given the nature of uh, the scale and size of the response. So these are some of the things to factor in. Also. One of the other elements uh, that we had a lot of discussion about was how do you bring in resources from other departments that may not always respond with you, but because of the scale and complexity, you need to expand. Having those conversations in advance by way of how do you tap into the other resources that may be available to you uh, that normally aren't 
having those things in place is also part of the, the strategic response plan. Overall, ICS and IMS is a modular organization and you add modules as you need to and you take away modules as you need to. If you originally go out with three boats by way of doing uh, an immediate response to a finding of, of, of a grass carp, for example, and you realize that you really don't need all three, you can scale that back and you reduce the number of boxes. And it really is uh, completely based on what are your triggers? Uh, so what makes it more complex? Is it sheer numbers of fish? Is it the fertility? Is it sterility? And as you build each element, there has to be somebody where they were indicating uh, that they are in charge or by way of there's an accountability or responsibility clearly indicated. And again, you only fill the functions that they are need when that are needed for the particular incident. So we talked about management by objectives, and this th those objectives are listed in an operational period based incident action plan. So the operational period again is going to be based on the nature of the incident. Usually, when something happens, operational cycles are very short in length. It could be as little as an hour. Every hour becomes a new operational period and you make a determination what is it that you want to accomplish within that operational period. As things progress, usually those operational cycles uh, become longer, but the same decision-making process happens where you have to come up with what are objectives that we want now want to do in the next four hours, or perhaps it might be in the next eight hours, or what do we want to accomplish this week uh, if something is really, really prolonged. Best practice is to have them in writing so that they can be very easily shared and communicated, especially with all the chiefs, so that they know what the expectations are and what are the objectives. Uh, but it could be uh, transmitted orally or, as I say, best practices in writing. But when you're operating on a one-hour uh, operational cycle, uh, it's very difficult to ensure that all everything gets documented and communicated quickly in writing, so that's where the verbal option is, is best. And following an incident, uh, and this is usually something that gets dropped, is you're so glad it's over that we miss the step of actually talking about how it went. And it's not just what went wrong, but really having an opportunity to capture uh, best practices that really worked well. Um, that perhaps you've never even tried before, but you tried it, it worked well, and we want to make sure we do it again. It's important to document those successes uh, so that we can ensure that future people responding to that same similar type of incident would have the benefit of your experience available to them. Obviously, things can go wrong, and it's important to document those as well and put together a plan about how to address it. And it's important to do that as quickly after the, the incident concludes as possible simply because you want to capture the information while it's fresh in mind. Um, there'll be opportunities to have more in-depth conversations as you're developing uh, new protocols to respond to the lessons observed. And then next time you respond, whether it be in practice or in reality, uh, it's a way of testing your new procedures based on those lessons. I'll, I'll turn it over to back to Becky to talk about some examples of how they've responded in the past, as well as talking about an exercise we ran to test uh, the formalized st strategic re response plan that we developed together. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, yeah, I thought this would be very valuable to walk through a couple of examples because it does help um, give information on how uh, we got to where we are today. So this is an example uh, from September 2015 when three fertile grass carp were caught um, basically in downtown Toronto, so right off uh, downtown city of Toronto. Uh, this incident had three agencies involved with the federal government, provincial government, as well as the municipal conservation authority. In this incident, uh, we had over 20 staff members on site a day and up to seven boats out on the water. And this led to over 550 man hours of on-site activity conducted 
with an additional 182 man hours of DFO time offsite. So as John notes, it is important to note what went well and what are some of the best practices, but I'm going to just talk through sort of what went wrong. Um, so the first day that this uh, occurred, uh, our entire internet and BlackBerry service uh, was completely disrupted, uh, which made having um, communication among the staff very difficult, as well as to communicate the incident to our senior managers. We also had a brand new electrofishing boat, which um, with being brand new, you think would work great, but unfortunately it was not working very well, which um, was making it very difficult to implement the operational activity of the incident. Um, during this time, um, we also got word of two other captures of grass carp, um, and one was in the Bay of Quinney, so Eastern Lake Ontario, and the other one was Point Pelee, Western Lake Erie. Uh, we were sending crews to um, Bay of Quinty and then turning around and sending them all the way to Point Pelee. Um, so they traveled a, a significant distance in four days and both of those individuals turned out to be sterile. This is very common uh, when doing a hot wash or a debrief after an incident, communication. Uh, uh, there's always, uh, always something to do with communication on how we can improve uh, communication internally, externally, and uh, within the uh, incident. So uh, I joke that, that we had a Dave problem, and thanks to Dr. Zeus, you can see on the right side that, uh, that maybe there's a Dave problem uh, in other areas of the world. But we had a lot of Dave, people named Dave. And uh, so somebody would say, well, Dave approved this, and uh, it was the Dave that didn't have the authority to make the approval. So we also had um, a lot of interest generated by these fish. It was the, one of the first times that we caught more than one fish in an incident. It was also downtown Toronto. It generated uh, a lot of interest. And we had a lot of people very interested in what was going on and found that we had a lot of cooks in the kitchen and that for some of those cooks, incident command system was very new and didn't understand the structure, didn't understand the communication flow, um, offering to help, uh, which we greatly appreciate the offer to help, but we do have a structure in place. We had a structure in place um, to get the help that we required, so um, that was a bit of a problem. I don't think my senior managers like me using this word, but I said <laughs> feeding the beast. Uh, there was a lot of questions, a lot of need for information, um, so we had, uh, I was dealing with a lot of emails, I was dealing with a lot of calls from the media, um, which interrupted uh, the operations that we were trying to implement. And interesting, uh, during this time, there was an election called, which uh, does make put on onto us a little bit more difficulty in dealing with approval process and with um, uh, talking with the media and providing information to the media that was considered um, non-life-threatening information during this, what is known as a writ period. So fast forward into a um, to, to the next year, and this is Lake Gibson, which is off the Welland Canal in uh, in between Lakes Ontario and Erie. So the, we uh, a, a fish was captured by an angler who caught it on a snag, and uh, he, he sub subsequently released it uh, from the area of capture on June 9th. He posted this on um, Facebook and Twitter, and uh, somebody alerted to him that, and he didn't know what he had caught. He thought he just caught a great big fish, and, and how interesting is this? Uh, he was alerted that the fish he caught looked like a grass carp, and he should report it to the Invasive Species Awareness Program hotline. And he did so on June 11th, uh, which we greatly appreciate. Um, on, so on June 11th, we were immediately alerted to this uh, fish being captured. Um, we did have to go through verification um, to make sure that the photo and video did occur in Ontario. And uh, we, we were able to confirm it did. And so we prepped to make a plan to go out on Monday, June 13th. So this is uh, a picture of Lake Gibson. And you can see with the red star, that was uh, where the angler caught this uh, grass carp. Um, 
with a bit of information and certainly some valuable help from uh, Ontario Power Generation, we were able to get an idea of the lake system and the connectivity to other bodies of water and determined that the connectivity was quite low actually um, because of the screens and um, generators that are, on, that are on the outflows. So a reminder of the typical uh, incident command system structure as John walked us through. So response upon capture. Um, so we were um, we we were out there and um, conducting early detection surveillance on um, in this river based on uh, the video of the angler that caught this and posted on social media. So we had been out there for a few days actually and not finding any fish. And then on the uh, in the morning of the one day, one grass carp was captured. So a capture of a live confirmed grass carp does, in, or any Asian carp species, does um, have us go immediately into the incident command system. Now that doesn't mean that we send out SWAT teams and um, bombard the area with boats and, and crew, but we do start with a small structure. And this is our um, command structure that we had put in place. Now a couple things that you'll notice is um, there are differences based on the typical structure that John walked us through, but a reminder, as John mentioned, uh, you may not fill all the boxes. Um, there could be reasons for uh, resources available, and resources can mean people, as well as the size of the incident. So at this point, we had one grass car, um, and we don't have a lot of staff. So while all the responsibilities are added to the boxes, we don't fill all the boxes. For example, you don't see a safety officer here. So this is the structure that is put into place upon um, verified live capture of a grass carp. And you can see uh, that it does contain staff from both the federal government as well as the provincial government. Uh, we worked uh, very closely in a collaborative manner on all aquatic invasive species issues and especially when it comes to responding um, to live grass carp captures. So a few days later, uh, work continued, and uh, we were able to catch, as I said, sorry, and this is based on uh, that capture of by DFO of that grass carp, of a grass carp. And we, we hoped that that was the fish that the angler caught, and we caught that fish. And uh, But we needed to continue to conduct surveillance in that area to make sure there were no other grass carp found. And unfortunately, that was not the case. And in fact, just two hours later, three more grass carp were captured. Um, because of the number of fish captured in the time frame we were working on, uh, this triggered the operations uh, branch of the incident command structure. So you can see that now we've put in that uh, light blue box there on the bottom left. And we mobilized a strike team to go out and uh, to do more um, surveillance work looking for more grass carp. So this is um, the, the second set of captures that occurred uh, a few days later. So after a few days we didn't, uh, so we, we got a few more fish and we wanted to check to make sure that that the um, there were no other grass carp in adjoining and adjacent area. So um, through our in-place logistics chief and gather and planning chief to gather information, we were able to obtain um, um, con connectivity with uh, Lake Gibson and to start thinking about um, what kind of further operations might we need. So a few days later, we were sitting with a total of 10 grass carp, two of which were uh, found to be fertile. Um, that had us thinking we, for, in terms of operations that we needed to uh, expand our search area and therefore we needed to have more strike teams out on the water. So you can see at this point we had four strike teams out on the water and a greatly expanded incident command system structure. After a few days um, and some more testing that was done in terms of eDNA, 
Uh, there had been no further fish detected, and despite the expanded search area, uh, including past a, a turbine, uh, just to make sure we uh, no further fish were detected, so the incident was um, called off. The teams were told to stand down and to prepare for hot wash, which is uh, the debrief. So what went well and what could be improved? Well, we found that what went well was that we had a, a much more smooth transition into incident command with this compared to the Toronto incident. Uh, between the two, we had noted the communications issues. We had done some more training. We developed binders. So for each box in the incident command structure, each chief and each command staff, had a binder of their responsibilities, the forms they're supposed to fill out, and uh, we found that that helped make a much more smooth transition. It also helped with more efficient coordination between the two organizations. We had staff from both organizations in the incident command structure, and despite being two different government levels, um, everybody knows that you're, you are now reporting in this incident command structure. It does not matter if the person you are reporting to in the incident command structure works for your agency or not. Um, so that helped with this more efficient coordination, and it truly was a collaborative effort. So what could be improved? Well, we, we noted that we were reaching maximum capacity. Um, it was a larger search area. We had gotten a, the, more fish. Uh, we were starting to get concerned um, where we could draw resources in if this was to get any larger. Uh, luckily, after several days of not finding any Asian carp or eDNA detection, um, we uh, we were able to stand down before expanding, being put into a position where we would need to expand that structure. We did find that we needed stronger understanding in senior levels. Um, uh, that's uh, something that comes up because there's such a, a, a strong line of communication uh, within anybody's workplace and that this deviates from that line of communication. Um, so that was something that we thought we needed to work on. And we felt that maybe uh, a next step would be taking us out of the middle of an emergency and developing an on-water exercise where we could practice under non-emergency situ uh, situation to specifically address some of these ongoing issues in terms of communication and, and greater understanding. So we worked with John to develop an on-water training exercise, and you can really think of this as, as, as practice. That's exactly what we were doing. So we went out for a day, and in that day we pretended that there was five days uh, within that day. So there was that five days worth of response. We had an emergency operations center um, so that normally the command staff were, are working together from the various offices and having conference calls. This brought us together under one tent, literally, um, which you will see. So we um, we were able to be on site and work together face-to-face. Uh, -face. We had two strike teams on the water, one boat from the federal government and one boat from the provincial government. We invited uh, participants and observers, including the uh, senior managers, to come and to get a better understanding of how incident command structure runs, the, the conversations we have, the decisions that need to be made, and the activities that are undertaken under the uh, incident. And John developed various scenarios given to test our readiness, so to get us to start thinking ahead um, to um, help us refine and improve our current work um, and to be more prepared for some of the weaknesses that we had identified. So in general, the goals of this exercise was to, re was to refine our response protocol. As I mentioned, we had a protocol. We had binders for um, all, the, all the, the command staff and chiefs, and we wanted to test that and refine them um, by going through an incident not under an emergency situation. This would help familiarize the entire team with the roles and responsibilities of all those boxes and to practice response at different incident levels. As I mentioned, we were reaching our capacity um, at one point, and it did get us thinking, what if it had gotten bigger? What if more fish had been found? What if we found young? What if we found a different species than grass carp? So it's better to practice those responses now and not have to make 
decisions later if we're able to. So we wanted to use this opportunity to reveal those potential issues and come up with a plan ahead of time. It also allowed opportunity for managers in both agencies to observe incident command in action and to better understand the expectations of their agencies and the staff. We also really wanted to encourage discussions and foster that relationship between partner agencies. And there's no better way to do it than to actually um, get into action, put on the waders, and get out in the water. So I'm going to have Rebecca uh, turn on a video here. We did take a video of the um, on-water training exercise that helped to communicate our activities. Uh, to the general public, this was posted on Facebook, as well as to senior managers. So we have this video available in French and English, and we can make that available to anyone who wants to see it in a less choppy fashion, as well as to hear the entertaining music that accompanies what accompanies that. So moving on. Um, so some of the scenarios, as I mentioned, uh, John was great and came up with some scenarios to really test our ability to, uh, to be prepared and to help identify things we needed to work on uh, by having uh, one fish, two fish, sterile fish, new fish. Um, had us thinking about larger situations, different life stages, and other species of Asian carp. Uh, we had media requests. Um, he had actors from the local, local town come and pretend to be media. Uh, had concerned citizens coming up, uh, local politicians, and other government bodies. So this was all to test our readiness for um, situations that were a uh, more critical level than we've been dealing with, as well as our communications. So we certainly see this as a, as a huge success in our learning. Uh, we had a lot of strong team interaction and collaboration with DFO and MNRF, so the federal and provincial governments, and this just helped to solidify that. Uh, field staff uh, were able to see how the decisions were made in action and the uh, decision makers were able to see this field staff in action. That really does help when you're trying to direct operations uh, to have a greater understanding of what's going on. We were able to come up with a, with a good plan for and test uh, how to better get information to the media, uh, which is really important. And it was a good opportunity for us to start thinking about these larger incidences, incidents and how we can be better prepared for them. 
uh, the protocols that we had developed and the resources, those binders for each um, uh, box in the incident command structure did prove to be extremely helpful and we were able to continue to refine them. But overall, and we, we keep saying this, this is one of the, the, the um, important messages with being prepared, planning is key. So of course there's things that you know we want to continue to improve on and this uh, on water exercise helped to highlight that. Budget. Um, there were times when we were getting bigger and bigger in the scenario and we were able to say, sure, bring in more boats, sure, bring in more people. Um, but that was our magic wand. It was very easy to bring in imaginary boats and people, um, but in a real world scenario, we do need to be a little bit more prepared at, um, to implement that sort of thing. Uh, we knew it was important um, in, in this case uh, to do a better job at debriefing the boat crews. Uh, they were out on the water a little bit isolated from um, the work that was being done and uh, so this highlighted that we needed to implement uh, in our protocols an opportunity to reflect on the sampling that was done in the operational period as well as to at the end what overall the um, what kind of things did we see and what worked well. Obviously, as I said, communication is a big one and we continue to work on that. We want to make sure that we're really smooth and strongly communicating with uh, the people that, that really need to be involved within each agency and between our agencies moving forward. So next steps from that. Um, we're not done with our training. Um, I don't think uh, under these emergency response procedures it would be wise to think that you know we can we, we can stop with our training it's important for us to continue to practice in some way and um, now that we've seen the, the possibility of where our weaknesses lie with larger incidences we can now strengthen ourselves by engaging more partners and so we're beginning that work as well so that we're even more prepared um, to deal with all levels of incidences um, we, we know it's important for us to have pre-approved messaging so we don't waste time dealing dealing with um, approvals and um, refining wording. We, let's get this all done and out of the way at the beginning or ahead of time. Uh, we know that uh, we're going to need to adapt as needed and these training exercises and our experiences have, a, have um, allowed us to continue to refine those protocols and those binders. And those that protocol and the binders are, are what we call a final draft. Uh, we don't see um, that we have perfected the system. Uh, we continually learn through our experiences, through these training exercises, to continue to refine those. But at this point, we, you know, we feel we're really well prepared for this upcoming field season. So using the in-class training, using our on-water experiences, uh, exercises as well as our actual incident experiences uh, with John on, on, a, on working with us, uh, we were able to develop a strategic response plan. And this strategic response plan, this is not the first time we've been thinking about response. We've certainly worked with the province to develop a joint Asian carp surveillance and response plan. And this that plan provides a really good overarching framework under which this strategic response plan fits. And so we want to make sure that we're still following the structure and standardization of incident management and incident command. And so this response plan is focused on that command staff and the general staff. And in, in our case, we're making sure that we can be flexible to meet the resources that we have. And we want to make sure that we have a good understanding, and this helps with communication to our senior managers on response levels and triggers. So if we can say to them, we're in a level 1.1 response, they know what that means, and they know what are the expectations in terms of the resources that are out there. So I'm not going to go through every detail um, in, and get too far into the weeds. And I know that um, there's people on the phone that are looking to develop response plans for things other than Asian carp. And these triggers are very unique to Asian carp specifically. But this just gives an idea and a flavor to start thinking about what kind of um, criteria would create different levels of response. And it can be things like sterility. It can be 
species, it can be numbers, it could be location. And so these are all the things that we've put in um, for our Asian carp incident command response levels and triggers. And when we're in that first level of response, we've actually have we have developed this decision tree that helps um, everybody understand where we're going to be going when we're dealing with a level one response. And it helps to identify at which point do we start to raise the level uh, within level one. When do we move from a level 1.1 1 .1 to a level 1.2? And so this decision tree allows for that to happen and people are aware ahead of time of the path that we may be following. So not only do we understand uh, the incident command system in general, it is very helpful for senior managers to understand what does that mean in terms of people and, 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 and also resources available. So when we're in a level 1.0, we, we tend to have a very simple structure. And for us, Keeping incident command flexible and, and um, making it work with the resources that we have, it often looks just like this. So upon live capture, this is who we engage immediately. When we start to move up and we understand um, what we're dealing with, we have an identified species and we know the sterility of the species or the fertility of the species, we may move into a level 1.1 and it could look something like this. Again, the, how it's structured is, up, is at the discretion of the incident commander. When we're dealing with fertile species, things may look a little bit different in terms of how many people are out there. And again, this is all at the discretion of the incident commander. As we move up the level of concern and we're getting into higher levels, uh, it does trigger more people to be involved in the incident command structure expands. So some last words on the use of incident command system as a response to invasive species. Preparedness is key. It is, we have noticed that we are able to effectively and efficiently and quickly respond to these incidences because we're being more prepared and we know what to expect. The, com the um, reaching out to our partnerships is also key. There's no one agency out there that can do do it all uh, and we, we need to work together and that does by, by default leverage and increase the resources that are available to deal with various levels of incidents. Communication is key, and this in, having this incident command structure well in place ahead of when you need it really does help with that communication issue, which was something that was frequently flagged for us as we move forward. And I think we're, we're getting into a place now with a lot of this final draft protocol in place where we will find that communication becomes less of an issue moving forward. We also feel an, a real key piece is this continue, continuous learning and refinement. Uh, we want to ensure that we're as prepared as possible. We do take this very seriously. Uh, we care very much about the Great Lakes and we want to keep them safe from Asian carp. Um, while we focus on prevention, as I said at the beginning of the talk, we need to be prepared to respond if prevention fails. So, Thanks very much. Uh, the, these uh, two fish were found from Lake Gibson. I'll just flag that. And this is uh, last year's crew of summer students that uh, that we had on that. I also want to acknowledge uh, this is this is certainly not done by just John and I. We had a, a team of people that helped us develop this Asian carp protocol over the years. This is something that's taken taken several years to get to. Uh, Julia Combs, Tim Gingera, Jennifer Wright, and Dave Marzen, all with the Asian CART program, have had significant involvement in, in getting the documents and the binders all together. So appreciate their help very much. I'll flag, there's our, our contact information. Um, both John and I are very happy to answer any questions offline or to provide any information after the webinar. By way of some next steps for those of you who think this might be of value to your respective programs, 
I strongly encourage you to take advantage of the free online training for ICS 100. Uh, a Google search will very quickly pull up a few different options of free online training. The province of Ontario has one that they offer as a free resource. It will give you a little bit more explanation of its ICS and its value. If you think it's going to be of use, one of the things that worked really well uh, when working with Becky and her team was running ICS 402, which is for executives. It's a two-hour program which introduces the concepts to senior management and executive staff, but it also allows us to start managing expectations of senior officials uh, by way of communication expectations. What are some of the things that will be needed in advance? Um, in order to be better prepared to respond. So that could be a very valuable tool in how it's presented to your senior officials and uh, executives uh, to help them understand what your realities are, um, including communication realities, uh, the proverbial feeding the beast, as Becky mentioned. Uh, ICS 200 was the other training that was given to all of uh, the Asian carp in the Great Lakes team. Uh, that was a two-day program which involved interactive exercises as well as deeper understanding of the ICS uh, modalities and procedures. Uh, yet to be run is an ICS 300, which is pretty much a multiple-day live exercise, um, but a, a tabletop exercise where the different elements of ICS uh, can be tested and further understood by the students. So Becky was talking about continuing education, and this is all part of the, the opportunities that are available. And I want to make myself available to anybody who has some basic questions about how to integrate ICS into your respective organizations. I'd be more than happy to do that and see if we, I could assist with training as well. So I guess I'll turn it back over uh, to Rebecca for any questions that might have come in. Awesome, thank you both very much. That was That was great. We do have some questions. Um, there's about four of them so far. One of them is, will we be able to get a copy of the PowerPoint presentation by email? Um, I record the whole webinar and we post it on our website, www.asiancarp.ca. You can see it on your screen under the resources section, our whole series, any webinars we've done in the past, they're all on there. I'll probably get this one up sometime tomorrow or the following day. As for getting a copy by email, um, that would be up to Becky, I think. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I think we could probably make this into a PDF to make it easier to um, make available to those that write in and ask for it. Yep, we can do that. So I can I can forward a copy by PDF to Lucy. Um, the other question that came in, has there been any thought to using daughterless fish to control or eliminate populations of Asian carps in North America? Yeah, there, so a lot of research on control techniques is being done um, by the um, United States Geological Survey. And while there's many different ways and many different research projects looking at various control techniques, I do know that the daughterless fish is, is being assessed. Awesome. Next question. Um, have you worked with the Asian Carp Regional Coordinating Committee in the U.S.? They have used this approach to respond to Asian Carp found near Chicago. Yes, and I actually was part of that incident in Chicago um, few, many years ago, and that was actually my first, um, first ex exposure to the incident command structure, and I, I knew once I was part of it, uh, me along with 499 other people, that I saw the value in having something so structured and organized, and I wanted to bring that uh, to Canada. So that's when I started working on um, bringing this to Canada, and when we got the Asian Curve program in 2012, I knew it had to be an important element of it. Uh, we do work very closely with the United States. We do both countries view these Great Lakes as a shared resource, and um, uh, and we do want to protect them from uh, Asian carp. So, uh, yes, definitely work very closely with them. And we, DFO, as well as the province of Ontario and Quebec, are members of the Asian Carp Regional Coordinating Committee. The next question is, the Australian government plans on using a virus called Cyprinid herpes virus 3 
My question is, are we going to be monitoring their efforts or even doing our own research on this virus here in Canada? The United States uh, Fish and Wildlife Service uh, did look at that and concluded that it actually would not, while it would work for common carp, which is of the species of concern in Australia, that it would not work well for Asian carp because of the uh, much longer lifespan. Um, so the answer is yes, it's been looked at, and it doesn't look like it would be very valuable for the Asian carp specifically. The next question is, have you considered a scenario and coordination needs for a potential binational incident command structure operation that might involve U.S. agencies and states? Yes, and we've done that. Funny you should mention it. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll jump in. We have done a couple sure. of of tabletop exercises with the United States, and it is something that uh, we want to work on under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Um, so that that is something that uh, we 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 are planning to work with, and we are doing work with the United States. Uh, I, I'm. Not 100% sure it will be under the incident command structure, but we do have plans to work with the U U.S. Um, in June. And John, sorry to, to cut you off, but you, you wanted to talk about that? I, I was just going to say that that was one of the multiple scenarios that uh, we had considered when looking at what that live wa on water exercise was going to look like, fully recognizing the need for that uh, partnership with the, the U.S. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, the next question is, would it be possible to get a list of the ICS courses available that John just mentioned in their description? Uh, if you want to send me an email, I'd be happy to provide that. Great. Um, the other question was just a little bit of clarification on where you can find this webinar recorded after, and it's on www.asiancarp.ca under the resources section. Um, it doesn't look like any other questions are coming through. So I think that's it. Um, so yeah, thank you, John, and thank you, Becky, for taking the time to speak to us today. That was a really great webinar. Oh, another question. Do you have any on-water training exercises planned for 2018, and would that be something that the public could view? Um. Uh, so we, we're just in the beginning of planning our field season that's coming up. Um, that's an interesting question is to have the public to, to come view it. So um, as, we're, as we're developing our plans, um, that's something that we'll keep in mind. We are meeting with the province of Ontario um, in, in a month or so, and maybe I'll add that to the agenda item to, to consider. Neat idea. During the live water exercise we did last year, uh, there were many uh, local residents who wandered by and found it very fascinating to learn more about what it was we were doing. Um, so we certainly didn't block access. It's just uh, we never considered doing an open invitation to the community to, to come observe. Um, another question is, how quickly do you respond? So I'd say um, actually it would be really interesting to to see how how much that's changed over time. Um, at this point, so if it's DFO or uh, that catches uh, or the province that catches uh, a live Asian carp, um, because of the protocols in place and the communication protocols in place, we are able to uh, implement a command structure uh, within minutes. Of being notified of the capture and, and having and having that verified. Um, if another um, if it's caught by some somebody else, so sometimes it takes a few days to, for word to reach us, and therefore it, it takes a while. But um, we are able to mobilize the operations branch very quickly. Um, we have that, I would say, down within a few hours um, because we. We may have to pack up gear. Uh, we may have nets out on the water in another area, and we have to pull those in. And uh, but we can be as as quickly as um, you know, less than half an hour as well. So it does vary, but I would say over time we certainly improved our response time. Awesome. 
So now that's all the questions we have. Um, thank you, John and Becky, again, for taking the time to speak to us today. Just another reminder, the webinar will be posted on our website in the next couple of days. Um, there's a really short survey following this webinar, so if you could take a couple seconds to fill it out, that would be greatly appreciated. So thank you again, John and Becky, for and stay tuned for future Asian Carp webinars. Thanks.